Live hey, good morning, everyone, and uh, evening to you, Daniele, in Italy. Hey, Dan, and how you doing? Great, great. We've got a great topic we're going to talk about today. Uh, very excited to hear your input, and we've got uh, Robert Gerard here with us this morning. So let me uh, kind of frame this up of what we're going to talk about. Last week, and I'm Dan Gay, Chief Marketing Officer of Block Search Blockchain, and uh, I'm joined here with some uh, awesome guests to talk about uh, the power of people, the power of money, retail versus uh, old uh, the old guard in Wall Street. And uh, last week we talked about the landscape and how it's changing with the digital uh, finance. And um, Tim did a great job of uh, tying a lot of pieces together and what's happening as the ground is shifting in the financial world under our feet. And uh, just amazing what has happened, uh, wild, wild west on Wall Street over the last uh, few days. And uh, we're going to get into that and talk about that. So, you know, we're going to talk about DeFi, uh, GameStop, uh, Robinhood, um, hedge fund shorting, and uh, the market and merger of tech and finance. And then also uh, the merger of the power of the people and uh, social media. So some pretty amazing things uh, to talk about here. So uh, we invited uh, Robert Gerard, who's a, a market expert, and he's the uh, COO of Blockchurch Blockchain and the president of Credence Code. And uh, good morning to you, Bob. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Dan, for having well, me. Yeah, and on short notice as well. So thank you. <laughs> no we have uh, Daniele Minci, who is uh, the president of Fusion STX, who's joining us from Italy. Hi again there, Daniele. Hey, Dan, a great pleasure to be here as always. Great, thank you. And then we, uh, as always, we have the founder of Block Search Blockchain, the chief architect and the CEO, Mr. Tim Vasco. Hi there, Tim. Hey, Dan, how are you today? Doing great, thanks. So let's get into this. I don't know who wants to start. What a, with, uh, what a week, what a week. Well, yeah, I have to say, this, is, this, was, uh, this was a crazy week for me. I uh, had my kids telling me about bringing down the Wall Street guys, right? And they're, they're, they're telling me what's going on. I'm like, literally, I was working so hard on our stuff when this all, all hit, I wasn't actually even aware what was happening. And um, my daughter came and she goes, so dad, what's this all mean? Is it like that movie, The Big Short? And I said, yep. <laughs> That's pretty much it. It was, uh, and we started it's talking pretty about- much it. It shorting stocks were um what uh what's happening and i said you know this is going to be the subject of our world from here on friday and by the way this is what DeFi and all that stuff we've been talking about is or cloud power to the people and uh, our our tagline says it about uh decentralizing um, decentralizing technology, software, finance, that's what we're all here to talk about. So let's get into it. I mean, it's crazy what power to the people means um, in terms of economics. And frankly, time is long overdue to see these kinds of shifts happening. Um, Bob, you and I uh, uh, and Dan are all old enough to have seen these shifts before. I'll never forget yep. 1987. And that's dating myself, but I'll never forget. I was Black Monday. UBI, Black Monday. Yeah. <laughs> when that happened, and I ended up at that time uh, not sleeping like I did this week, Danielle. Yeah. It's been a week without sleep. Um, but at that time, I ended up with uh, with uh, pneumonia. I was wow. deathly ill in the middle of all of that going on, and I owned a financial firm. I was. Uh, I was trading and and uh, so let's talk about what happened. Let's talk about uh, fading, call it fading the shorts. <laughs> I think what happened, um, it, it probably never happened in history. Um, um, the way it, is, right. it has configured. I think it's, it's not the Black Monday. It's not what happened in 2008. It's in my view, it's way bigger because yeah. uh, in the past, there were some kind, let me call it market inefficiency that all people were aware of, that all in a sudden, because of something, a trigger, something has exploded. But it was not something new at the end. There were some fundamentals 
and uh, something bad that happened and exploded over time. It was just a matter of time. Right now, what happens is like, uh, to me, is like before we've been discussing about everything that happens on planet Earth. But right now, we have planet Earth and the moon. They are colliding together. And now we're discussing about this because we have two planets then trying to work close each other in a kind of a symbiotic relationship. And what happened this Tuesday is that they collided. And now we say, how can we recover from this collision, right? So in a very specific term, what happened, there were three stocks um, called uh, GameStop, probably you're you aware of it, AMC Enter Entertainment and Nokia, that were delisted from a brokerage firm, one of the most known brokerage firms, which is called Robinhood, uh, this Tuesday. And to give a number, what happened on, for example, the GameStop uh, stock, the stock went up only on Tuesday by 95%. And uh, aggregated yearly performance of 2021 were eight, 858% high, okay, this year in such a short amount of time. Oh, yeah. And why this has happened without going too much in the detail is like those two planets, so let me call it the Wall Street guys were shorting <laughs> and the retail were going long. And the more the professional investor were shorting, the more they had to buy. Uh, uh, stocks. So the price keep on raising while people were shorting the markets. It was like an infinite loop. Okay. And uh, once a Robin Hood was requested to comment why that happened, they said, well, we just follow the rule not to break up our platform. They didn't say it was a liquidity issue. They didn't say the SEC called to stop. At the end of the day, they say, hey, we just followed the rule and we couldn't continue to allow buying for this stock. And no, Daniel, but they allowed selling. <laughs> they allowed yeah. selling, well, but they stopped buying. Yeah. Yeah. They stopped yeah. buying. And very few people remember that something similar that happened back in the day with Volkswagen stock. Right. Exactly the same. <laughs> but right now, so those stocks have been delisted and there was no collision between retail and, and professional because at that time it was only professional investors. What we're experiencing right now, it's, it's a new world where retail taking active steps in the game, they're not gaming the system, they just want to participate. They just want to have a chance to win or to lose with the money. But right now they are prevented to have a chance. That's the biggest reflection. I want to go through it right now with all you guys. Well, I think that the, um, I think that the reality of this kind of uh, evolution, as you point out, Daniele, is that when we saw this happening, or as we see this happening, what we see is a complete change in what possibly could have happened ever before, which is a short selling. So to just do a primer for those people who don't know what happened, I'm going to explain this like I explained it to my teenagers. Yeah, simple. Okay. Here's what happens is you go out and there's a bunch of stocks sitting in accounts and brokerages for years, uh, especially sophisticated, this is a sophisticated move, um, are able to sell short. They borrow the stock. If Dan has GameStop stock in his account held in street name, meaning it's held by a broker, Correct me if I get this wrong, Mr. Gerard, please. No, no you're, um, doing good. you're doing good. It's, it's held by a broker and I'm a trader. I can have an account that allows me to sell short. In other words, I can borrow that stock from Dan's account, right. put it in my account, and let's say it's $10 to keep it simple. I can sell it for $10. So I say, Dan, Dan doesn't may not even know this is happening in his account because for all practical purposes, it's just the loan that the brokerage firm is handling. And I go in and I borrow that stock and I sell it to the market for $10. Why do I do that? I sell it something I don't own. I don't own it. I sell it on margin, actually. Um, margin meaning I borrowed something. Right. And when I sell that for $10, I'm expecting that it's gonna go to five, right? The question becomes, 
to get to Danielle's point, who am I selling it to? And how do I have enough confidence to know that I, or think I know that it's going to go from 10 to five? Well, I'm a sophisticated investor. I did my research. Now, who buys it at 10? Generally, non-sophisticated investors, right? Usually, it's people going, oh, GameStop. I like Everybody's it. playing games right now. Bet that's a good company. They don't think about the fundamentals of the company. They don't think about how, what their overhead is. They don't think about... Hey, that storefront is probably shut down because of COVID. They don't think about that. They think or they, yeah, they're making or losing money. Yeah. You know, they might miss a bunch of stuff. Analysts don't miss that stuff. They do tons of research and they figure out, you know what? That thing is public and it's probably going to go down. It doesn't have any fundamentals to hold up. So um, when did we see this happen before in the last year. Well, what about airline stocks? Do you know how much money was generated in a few days when the airlines shut down by the short sellers? All right. They sold it at the top and watch the bottom fall out. Question is this, who did they sell to? That's the elephant in the room. Yeah. Somebody paid them at that point. That's right. the retail investors. Go ahead, Bob. I'm sorry. Well, I was getting ready to say, and, and on top of that, uh, Tim, not only did they short, they, they shorted a hundred and some hundred and forty three percent of the stock. Okay. <laughs> they didn't even short a hundred percent, but a hundred and forty three more than the, than the outstanding shares that were out there. Right. So in order to cover those shorts. They have to buy and then buy again in order to cover their shorts. Wow. Yeah. And, wow. and Do I understand so that was like sixteen billion dollars. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's incredible. Yeah. But yeah. but I do want I do want to talk a little bit about because I, I as as Tim said I do come from a banking background I do have a, a Wall Street background and I will tell you from the fundamentals from Robin Hood's perspective and freezing up the, the the stop the selling of that it's mainly because their liquidity there was so much trading going on and so much happening they you have to understand how robin hood works robin hood is not direct a direct wall street or or nasdaq listing they actually go out to the various large houses and buy their stock through them so for example one of their big uh buyers that they buy stock through is citadel well, guess what? what? What is Citadel? They're a larger They're major player. <laughs> and guess what side of the coin were they on on GameStop? They were a shorter. They shorted that stock. So the, part of their problem was the liquidity and being able to settle all these trades that were going through. As a matter of fact, I uh, I was reading online that they're gone out to get, uh, I don't know, it's a $6 billion loan or $6 million loan to be able to cover all this settlement of trading once they open up these trades. So you, you it, from, from a mental standpoint and what they did, I understand. Now, it's not right. It still doesn't make it right. They weren't, you know, you had the the retail people that were coming in and buying this stock on the bet. And I'm I'm just I'm like you, Tim. I learned more about it from of an employee of my wife's that <laughs> literally right. betting his savings in hope that it's gonna go up by this, you know, 300, 400 percent to be able to buy a home. You know, right. that's what he was doing. So he's got he's either gonna be more or he's gonna be able to get a home. If you yeah. try to simplify from a mechanical standpoint, which is we have a professional investor that has been trying, I'm not saying to game the market, but at least to to leverage and to take the benefit out of it by shorting it, right? Yes. With this mechanism. And at the same time, since the on the other flip, on the other side of the coin, there were other guys that they believe that this stock went uh, was going high, even though from a fundamental point of view, the profession were saying it was going down because revenues uh, uh, and everything yeah. was, you know, declining like hell. Yeah, Post COVID uh, was even worse than pre COVID. You know, their performance as a whole. So fundamentally, wise, you know, there was no chance. It was a hopeless stock. 
you know, for the professional investors. But right. retail, because there is a, a, a follow, um, there is a Reddit group called uh, um, Wall Street Bets, followed by two million people. Mm -hmm. So we have to give power to people, whatever they're right or wrong. They are using their money, uh, and once right. you use the once you use your money, you need to have a chance to win or to lose, because right. today's democracy is technology. So what is really getting me nervous is that the fact that people want to step in, play with their money, and they're prevented to do it because there is a kind of systemic issue. Right. That's and, bad. And that's and, bad. And, you know, and Very bad. Talks, that's kind of the point we've been talking about. That is the point we've been talking about. Not only money and technology is when these big institutional players have an ability to block this kind of natural market phenomenon. Okay. This wasn't a regulatory block. No. There's nothing going wrong here. No. No, the only yeah. regulatory that came out was this morning was an SEC warning of potential market manipulation. Right. And they froze yeah. they froze the trading of GameStop for probably 15, 20 minutes. And that's been it. Right. The rest of it has all been self-imposed by tra that's by right. the uh, houses. So 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 Wall Street played the game and they lost. Right. They played and a they game don't, and they don't like to lose. They don't like to no. lose. They played a game in a different business. What do they say about Vegas? It wasn't built on winners, right? Exactly. <laughs> the house always wins. Yeah. Well, guess what? The giant house, the great chiefs of Wall Street got it handed to them. To them. And exactly. Bob, I don't know if you remember this. I'm going to show. Rich, you remember <laughs> Trading Places, the movie? This is what it yeah, felt like. Yeah, kind of yeah. Like it felt like, like that. Yeah, like Tim there. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> do you remember that? Yes, I 2015, do. I was in Silicon Valley and, and spoke at Finnovate, and that was the article that was written about it. And uh, it says right there, and it's true, Vasco, if not the new breed of Wall Street, is the near future of it. Well, that was in 2015, right there. And guess what? The the time is here. The future is here now. Right. The, the reality is that that we have variables of communication we never had before. We have technology that has capacity like DeFi and things that never happened before. And I want to get back to this point because I don't think we made it fully. Who did Wall Street sell to? The retail market. Right? Yeah. And you know what? The retail market said, great, GameStop. We'll buy. Not only we're going to buy, we'll buy more than you got. Not only that, we're going to keep buying. You guys think it's great? You're selling at 10? We'll make it 20. We'll make it 100. We'll make it 300. Yeah. You guys are selling. We're buying. That's free market. Right. And that's we back to what lot. we can buy a lot. Right. Well, it, it, it was to, that's it, it was to show. Dollars. Yeah. It was like like Danielle said that the Wall Street bets, it was to show Wall Street to, hey, we don't agree with your bet. We're gonna we're going to we're going to take you out and to show you the power of the people. Versus the power of Wall Street, because Wall Street, for the right. longest time, these hedge funds have done things that they get first in. They get manipulate. They are able to manipulate the markets to their wills and the way. Now, and Wall Street hates to lose. I mean, I'm going to tell you, I've been there, and I know they hate to lose. And they will find ways to get back, and that's well, going to be their I've, I've the long-term issue I've been here. There too. They they hate to lose. They hate to do things by the rule they write the rules so right. they do things by the rules and bob i lived it i had my i had a i took, took on a 15 billion dollar wall street company called Finova capital they crushed me when i was a young guy crushed me because they don't like to admit what they're doing wrong now of course they turned out four years later to be the biggest fraud in history and the biggest bond default in history but I said it. I was a little guy, and boom, got smashed. 
yeah. and got sanctioned and everything else that comes along with being the little guy. Guess what? The little guy has a voice. Right. The little now guy they and, and, has power like yeah. never before. Right. And that's what you're saying. Back with the social social media and the ability to get our voice out. Now, there is some concern, though, just like uh, Daniele was talking about. The um, uh, what was the group? I forgot the name. Uh, uh, Wall Street Bets. Wall, Wall Street, Street Bets. Bet. They actually were taken down for a period of time. Social media sure. took them down. They took them down. You got Facebook today has banned all uh, stock talking groups uh, mm -hmm. off of their site. So now you say you got your voice, you be able to get out. But if you have these big techs that say, hey, I need to side with Wall Street because that's where my capital, my money comes from. And now they start clamoring you down. You know, do you have that voice anymore? So, and, and, and now it comes back to this big question of centralization, doesn't it? Right, it does. Centralization, like centrali centralized power without regulatory consequence. Yeah. Centralized power without compliance. You're losing money. If you're losing money, do you just get a stop? Do you just get a, I, I have another story. There's a business school named after this guy. He wiped out a hundred jobs, a hundred jobs. Okay. Of people who had worked at this company for 30 years. He invested 5 million bucks in the company, started going under, but he put the money in as a loan when he didn't want to put any more money in. He, he, as both the majority owner of the company and the creditor, filed a statement of bankruptcy on the company. Listen to this. Filed a statement of bankruptcy on the company. Was able to fire all the people with no benefits. On the top of the filing of the bankruptcy, he was both the creditor and the person who filed. Both signatures the exact same. People were literally on the street looking for ways to buy groceries he sold the company got his money back and they named a business school after him okay how's that for the way business works and is it right and you, yeah and you get is and you right? get rewarded for it and you get rewarded for it by having your name on a business school that students in the future chant right literally guys this is a systemic problem in yeah. the world. This is not this is not about the fact that some people lost 16 billion dollars and some people are reveling in it. This is about as Danielle said, systemic perception of what business has been in the past and maybe in the past we needed these centralized authorities. Today we need trust, truth, and transparency. transparency. And, yeah. and this is the, we say that in our logo, but this is the dollar figure behind that. Right. I was going to say, <laughs> now you're putting it to dollars. Everyone's well, asking, how are you going to monetize? Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, a few years years ago. Ago. yeah sorry. Well, Hugh, oh, go, ahead. go ahead. No, I was saying that a few, few years ago, if you want to educate yourself, you want to get to know what's going on in the financial markets, what you have to do is just watching Bloomberg, right? Why yeah. now, now you have Reddit, you have Twitter, you have Telegram. You didn't exactly. have this before. And Correct. even more, you have systems in the, in the decentralized architecture that have no circuit breakers and they have no bailout systems embedded into it. This is huge because well, it opens up. And what, what strikes me is I read this week also, um, uh, President Biden put a freeze on a lot of stuff, yeah. but he put a freeze on the um, on the expansion of raising capital, and mainly it affects small businesses. Frankly. Yeah, it's all the all the SEC changes, all the SEC point. rules that were put out there to help in the recovery. And one, I can't remember who it was, senator or somebody wrote um, on the financial committee. Investors don't want this. And um, and uh, uh, institutions are fine at raising the money. Mm. Wait a minute. 
wait a minute, excuse me. So investors don't want to be able to put $100 in a crowdfunding campaign or in a small market cap company to take a risk like only venture capitals wanted? Venture capitalists are qualified to do that? Right. This, this, that makes no sense. It doesn't. And, and frankly, control. economically, it doesn't make sense. It it rewards the wrong people. Right. It puts too much pressure on the cost of getting that out there. This isn't about regulation. Like, let's go back to that. It's not about regulation. The regulations were followed. This was about the institutional uh, institu institutionalizations of profit being challenged. Well, it's keeping the old, the boys club, the small the boys, boys club. club. Yeah, that's, and that's exactly seeing. what it does. And it keeps yeah, the power, as Dan it. said earlier, into the hands where this was the first time that the retail, the people stood up against the big guys and said, hey, no more. And that's, that's why cool. you, you see it. And you, I mean, I read, you know, tweets from, you know, Mark Cuban that's praising this. There's several people praising the, uh, the bar stool, um, you know, investor, uh, was it, uh, Doug Portnoy? Yeah. He's, he's talking about it and there, there's already been, uh, lawsuits filed. I mean, the average age of the trader on Robin hood is 31. Right. <laughs> exactly. I mean, so, you know what this group, and they've had, these, these I think they, kids, you know, you know who I found out about it from Bob? A guy daughter, trying to pay, that's that's just finishing law school and says, I want to pay off my student loans. Well, the, the whole premise of Robin Hood was, yeah, yeah I know, exactly. Pay well, off my Robin student loans. Right, right, right. I mean, the whole premise was free trade. You know, you don't pay a, a brokerage fee for the trading. And their model was, I mean, you know, they sell your, they sell your trading information. Guess yeah. to who? They sell right. it back to, to the to the big hedge funds and everything, so they can see what's going on from a trading pr uh, perspective. The number one stock held on on uh, on Robinhood, you know what that is? No, no. Tesla. <laughs> really? Tesla is the number one held stock, followed by uh, was it NOI, the uh, Chinese uh, electric vehicle company? Well, there's there's another one um, uh, where Elon Musk tweeted this week: the power of a tweet. I kind of like Etsy. Boom! It goes up a billion dollars in valuation. Yeah. Well, Should we stop that? He, yeah, he just did it yesterday. He said uh, something about BIO, and then came back and corrected it and said Bitcoin. Well, what did Bitcoin went from under thirty thousand to now trading somewhere over thirty-seven thousand? Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight. Thirty-eight thousand. Thirty-eight. Yeah. And and so these are wildly moving uh, variables in the market. This Absolutely. is a new variable. We've seen it. We've seen it in politics. We see it in finance now. This is this is the voice speaking in this new market. And as to your point, Bob, should that voice be restricted? Should that voice voice be silenced by the people who have a stake in, frankly, well, they, on the opposite side? <laughs> on the opposite side, yeah. right? And and that's kind of the idea. That is the idea of DeFi, DeFi. It's also the idea of block certs, frankly, which is should a tech company be able to put you out of business because they've got your data, they've got the software, and you're kind of stuck. You're stuck in the middle. You can't even use that software or even access your data. you got a bad month. You can't pay your fees. Go all the way back to all those months you had a bad month. Right. Pay all those fees, catch them up, then we'll let you go back into business. Right. How does right. that work? Yeah, that's how the whole... Multi-trillion dollar software industry works. Same mm -hmm. thing. Who, who holds the cards? And and frankly, uh, it's always been that way until now. We're, right. seeing, we're seeing who holds the cards in this game. Well, and if you step outside of your world, like if we were Martians or something, looking back down and seeing this happen, it's all about change. And we've been seeing this change happen throughout this year, what we talked about with uh, tokens now being listed on exchanges and the DeFi model. This is just uh, one uh, one component of change, and it will be interesting as we look week look, after week to see what. Look, look at the banking. Yeah. Open banking, right? Challenger banks, peer to peer right. lending, all of these things. It's the same version, a very visible one, for sure. Yeah, but before, yeah. let's say that before, you know. Uh, if we come back by a few months, 
there were no real decentralized marketplace available. There were none. Right. Because right. the ones that have tried to launch something back in 2018, and they're much more advanced than, for example, Uniswap at the time, two years ago, they were still building uh, the same market making functionalities on order book that can cannot work on a blockchain, on an Ethereum blockchain, because it's too expensive and because of you have too many variables to control that it doesn't work on the blockchain. What happened right now, and Uniswap, not only Uniswap, but many others, have used uh, a very, very nice uh, uh, technology to replace the traditional market making functions right. via the book, via automatic market makings. It's huge what happened. I read the paper from the Cornell University. It's amazing the validation that Cornell has given to these models. Also the model used by Balancer. It's another protocol. So what happens right now is essentially when you trade a stock, you. Right now, you cannot trade a stock on a decentralized exchange. Okay, right. Maybe in the future you can, but right now you cannot. But let's say if you um, if you play with uh, with a token on a decentralized exchange, so you swap a token on a decentralized exchange, essentially that environment cannot be attacked by front running. It right. cannot. So That's there's right. no uh, uh, there's no algo trading that can manipulate the market extensively. It cannot. It's uh, it's resistant. It's proven to be resistant to this type of financial manipulation. This means at the end of the day, when you you swap on a decentralized exchange, you cannot do the same as you're doing on to centralized exchange. That's you right. cannot. And and it's it's not only it's 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 risk manipulation is what it is. Yeah. It's actually risk manipulation. If you hold information and data back, we mitigate our risk and we set the market right no transparency you know, yeah the, the historic version of that if you ever heard about the ship the cuddy sark that became so famous in trading the reason the cuddy sark was famous for china trade for the trade from the far east coming to um coming to the west was because it was faster i was gonna say it was fast and they had the information. So if the goods that were loaded up in Asia were abundant, they already knew the market when it, when the rest of the ships got there would be flooded with that good, but they were the first ones there so they could set the price, right? Tim, That's when you said Cuddy Stark, uh, when what? you said Cuddy Stark, there are a lot of people uh, that are streaming. Like an alcohol. Cuddy Stark, yeah. Alcohol. But it, that was named after the ship, right? Yeah, right, exactly. right. right. <laughs> and, and so, you know, when we look at this and we look at the fact that, and going back to what that is, selling short, $10 going down to $5, you're making a lot of money. But $10 going up to $50, you're losing a ton of money. Right, right. And... <clears throat> and somebody was still being stuck and expect, they expected to be stuck with that sale just like happened with the um with the airlines yeah and like we have a lot of people that are saying well you know power of the people but they're going to be stuck holding the bag here soon i i was gonna say that's the thing is is that all of these big houses that lost a bunch of money well guess what they'll double down with their uh shorting at three hundred and fifty dollars on GameStop and and expecting it to drop and because expect it to come back. Yeah, the fun, I mean, the fun, like Daniele said, the fundamentals the fundamental as far as GameStop are not to not there to support a three hundred fifty dollars. No. Correct. I mean, that's Correct. a fact so, of life. So, and, and, so getting on that, Bob, I think it would be really important to kind of highlight both the knowledge, the wisdom of the market, fundamental versus technical, right? So this is. This is technical, a technical up with a fundamental downside. Right. Right. And that happens in crypto all the time. So I'm going to say this, but I want you to address that. Okay. That's what we're always saying about blockchain and, and cryptocurrency and tokens and things like that. There is technical trading happening all the time in these cryptocurrencies and it's pure speculation. How many times mm -hmm. have we said that in these? There's no utility. There's no. There's, no, there's nothing behind it. Yeah, it's like there's if you're a believer. Yeah, if you're a believer in the coin, and you know, it's just like Bitcoin. There, it's okay. not like it's a gold-backed, you know, token. 
That's right. So, so that's technical trading at its finest. The crypto market is the purest sense of technical trading using a technology that enables that without any revenue streams or fundamental analysis behind it. As soon as you start bringing in something like what we're doing at Box Certs, where you go, well, this is software. It's got true value. It's got true revenue that can be can drive fundamentals in there. What happens then to the value of that blockchain or that token on it? That's tokenomics. Yeah, because yeah, so you, you can actually tie a value to it of what would it cost me to go out in the market to do the same things that Block Search can do for me today, but then I'd have to go to four or five different companies to do the same we, thing. We, and I just, our, but, but there is one step, in my view, there is one step that comes before, that is inclusion. You have to first allow people to participate and right. then, o open and then, free. Yeah. then right. we're going to address, we're going to address all the others. Right now, we are at the, at the tension of those who two planets that are colliding, right. because first we need to include the retail in the game. Right now, they're not. They're not included extensively in the game. Obviously, they can buy Tesla, they can buy Facebook, obviously. Mm -hmm. But the, the big revenues are in the pocket of the small guys, right. the yeah. professional investors. So we need to you know, get the information crypto. first. That's true in crypto, too, Daniel. Yeah. It's this, the big revenues and the big wins are in the pockets of the guys who understand the crypto market and in the in Bitcoin who control the miners, who control the big, big buckets of Bitcoin, right? Yeah. You've said it before. Okay. What, maybe five in the world? Five, five people. Okay. Yeah. Can I, can I, I'm Daniele, Daniele, I've got a question for you in, in discussing this on the, you know, the stock. Do you ever foresee, because you, like you said earlier, there's really not a stock exchange or anything along that line in the DeFi market. Do you foresee with the stable coins and everything going up or that you could tie a stable coin to say a stock and then trade that stock on that, uh, trade that token on the, on the DeFi market or be able to, uh, you know, I'm just thinking I, I, that loud I, I, here. Let's say what, what, one step at a time, I would say in the sense that first, uh, uh, we need to solve one problem right now in order to have this happening, which is on the stablecoin side, probably you all aware what's going on with Tether in the US. Right. Because Tether is, you know, the third cryptocurrency by market cap, and it's currently under investigation, under whatever it is in the US. Right. Like because XBR of, is, yeah. Right, exactly. because they don't have the collateral uh, uh, that equalize the market value of that token. Okay. They don't okay. have it because this is a centrally issued coin. While right now in the market, there are different stable coins like, for example, USDC or um, MakerDAO, uh, which is the AI, which is a purely decentralized cryptocurrency, which will help to this, um, in, into this direction. In my view, what I can, well, in order to answer to your question, I definitely do see the future be totally decentralized. Yeah. Okay. That's step number one. How we achieve? I don't think the current, uh, the current development that we have is still there, because, for example, right now, if you want to trade uh, uh, um, an equity, a tokenized equity, over a decentralized exchange, there is a there is a compliance gap, because right. into decentralized exchange there's no KYC requirement uh -huh. being fulfilled. So right. at the end of the day, if you want to swap a token right now or a decentralized exchange, you have to buy the token or you have to mine a token eventually, but you have to buy a token from a centralized exchange, being KYC there eventually, and then go there and swapping in an anonymous manner. So this means the decentralized exchange don't fulfill the KYC requirement. I'm not saying they have to fulfill the way traditional centralized exchange doing. I'm just saying that there is a smarter way to fit into the requirement by not going through the usual process. And this right. is what we're trying to do. And we're trying and to help the regulator to fit into the requirement into a decentralized architecture because the future is decentralized. And that's right. the, the yeah, evolutionary the thing, project. right? Those it's the just, kind of, yeah, I'm sorry, Dan. But I was going to say, it's just an evolutionary thing. This is still young. Yeah. It's still early in the process, and you know we have to have uh, some regulations, and we have to have KYC uh, to allow that to flourish. But that's that's a something that's going to happen. 
And that's when we talk about transparency, we talk about all the research done on DFSO, the Digital Financial Services Observatory from Columbia, those kinds of things. You talk about papers from Cornell. It's not that this hasn't been researched. It's yeah. not that this has isn't aware. We talk about this stuff, but the fundamental realities are emerging here to show this is the trend. This right. is what's happening in the future. Um, and and that is when again back back to you, Bob, the difference between fundamental and technical. Right. Trading, right? Exactly. Like, no, absolutely. Trading, I, look at charts. I, I know. I have a hard time. My wife did buy some of that GameStop, and I'm trying to say sell, sell. <laughs> no, no. I use I use the old the old adage. I said pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. So That's what are right. you going to be? <laughs> the, the 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 um the kid who told me about it. I took the old Steve Miller band song, "Take the Money and Run," and I sent it to him. <laughs> Bird in the hands, worth two yeah. bush. Yeah. So okay, going back to the DeFi, and and one of the things that I I really think, you know, as your comment was, it's this whole process of bringing the the in the hands of the retail, and that's everybody, the public, uh, yeah. bringing it. So, for example, in because uh, I always dealt more in the bond world and the bond a uh, bond side of things, and. In the mortgage industry, you have all these financing that's being done on the backside to finance the permanent mortgages. We call those warehouse lines. So they're short term intermediate. So what are they? Where is the banks getting that money to lend out at prime plus two or prime plus three or whatever? They're getting it from the from the everyday depositor that has cash in the bank. It's in the savings alone. They're in their savings. They're in their credit, you know, in their uh, checking accounts. And then if it unbalanced, they go borrow from the Fed at very low, low rates. Well, I look at this DeFi in the borrowing and you talked about um, the compound right. or balancer, yeah. all of those yeah. type companies that have created where the public can now lend their money directly for these type of opportunities instead of getting a 0.2% return on your checking account or savings account, you're now getting something closer to the prime plus one, prime two, which is what the what the banks are getting today. So well, you're we bringing, cannot... that in and bringing that together. And I just want to make sure in a real world application that people can understand that, that how that how DeFi really, really works and touches them. Or can they, work. It, yeah, it can work. And, and it can be short term. Your money can be out on, on an average mortgage. It stays out maybe 30 to 45 days. Or if you want to be long term and you want the permanent loans, you could do it on a on a on the borrow. But then the information behind the collateral, you got collateral behind that money that you're lending out. It's not just you're not just lending money just to lend money. You're actually getting collateral. Where if you do it today in the banks, you don't have any collateral behind that. Your bank, your collateral is your trust in that bank. Right. Bob, you can go right now on compound.finance and check, for example, if you borrow, uh, sorry, if you lend uh, your USDT, I was checking right now, if you lend your USDT, you know what is the APY you get? No. 13.69%. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, where would it's you a, can't it's get a stable, that? It's a stable coin, you know? Yeah. I'm using DAI, I'm using other stable coin, uh, um, but uh, you know, that's my choice. But uh, at the end of the day, you land this, you get 10, 12, 13, seven, whatever APY, plus compound rewards the lenders with compound tokens that today's value is I think $250. Obviously wow. you don't get, you get a percentage. I think mm -hmm. it's 3%, 3% APY. So this means if you lend $100, you get three dollars worth of compound token at the end of the year, okay, three to four percent, something like this, which is on top of your, which APY. is on top of your APY. Yeah, you know. And so these platforms are crazy because they have right now. I think, think five. Yeah, sorry. Look at that, Daniele. We look at that. Is how this massive fee economy that keeps these institutions around is transforming, and that's true when we look at tokenomics that's true when we look at any kind of margin which is the people who drive the network own the network the right. people who drive the network benefit from the network there's costs to servicing those loans 
There are hard costs to providing software. There are hard costs to servers. And, and if, if it's decentralized, somebody's paying the bill for the There's, electricity yeah. and the compute power somewhere. Yeah. It, so it, the, there the are fees. costs in the economy. Those are fundamentals that aren't going to go away. The question is, who is going to get the profit margin above the costs? <laughs> That's getting ready to say, because then you got who, the profit margin on top of that. Who gets the profit margin and, and what is the market set profit margin? What, what, so it becomes a stabilizing effect. And these are new business models, new fundamentals based on transparency and trust. So when we talk about trustonomics at block search, that's what we're talking about. What are the economics of this trust market, this market that has transparency? I don't have to trust anybody. I just look at the market and I have to be smart enough, involved enough in that market that when I do take my risk, I don't have a little special secret um, piece of information back here that manipulates the risk. It's out there. That's why yeah. your your presentation is it can't work. That the traditional these traditional manipulations can't work. I, I mean, I didn't sleep much in the last nights because of this. You know, especially <laughs> overnight. So like, like, yeah, that's yeah. why I have. <laughs> I feel so tired. But uh, if I give you an example on how these things works, um, on for example, Uniswap, there are tons of Reddit subgroups on on Uniswap. And uh, there are some very, very complicated concepts like the oh, yeah. permanent loss that we spent, you know, we talked about it um, yeah. um, a couple of weeks ago. So, and you have people that are not professional traders that are trying to educate themselves on what impermanent loss is. Because if you are a liquidity provider of whatever uh, a token pair on Uniswap, whatever happens, it's called divergence of price, you're going to lose money when you withdraw your funds. If you provide liquidity and you withdraw, whatever is going to happen, if the price change by the time you deposit it, you lose money. But this loss is balanced by the fact that you are being rewarded with fees. At the end of the day, fees might be high, trading fees are being rewarded to liquidity providers. So you might, you might earn a reward that offset your losses. And you have people that are not professional traders, they are being educated on Reddit, on YouTube, by people saying, I think I'm losing money. Can you help me? And then you have tons of answers that explains what they have to do to balance the losses. So this is how how markets works today. You know. Let's let's talk about impermanent loss for a minute. Let me make an, a, a bridge there for everybody. Here's impermanent loss. Bob actually just talked about it. So what the brokers are gonna or what the houses are gonna do? They're not gonna sell their positions. They're going to double up. They're going to buy more of that or they're going to sell more sell of that more. stock. Sell more. So as it goes down, yes, on paper, they have a permanent loss. But now if they double their position or whatever and it drops and they can hold that position because they've got the capital to do it and it drops, at some point they break even or maybe even make money. That's right. impermanent loss. That's exactly it. They didn't liquidate the position. Therefore, they have a chance to recover and come back to even or maybe even make money. And the way Wall Street works, along the way, all those trades make money. They get a fee. Well, it's I can, the exact, I can put, the exact I, thing. I can put numbers to that. So if you looked at okay. yesterday before the market traded off on GameStop right. itself, it got up to, I think it was $485, $87, right? And then they halted trading and it drove it down to a hundred and what I say, 129 or $126. Right. Well, guess who sold at $485? Right. right. And then they came back and bought it back to close out those positions at right. $129. So right. that's how they doubled up. That's why all of the, all the shorts, they got out yesterday when the market was halted uh, for trading or for buying more new stocks. Right. And, and they made fees along the way. And made fees all the way. And they made fees along the way. So if you ever want to go watch a great movie, go rock, watch Trading Places. Yeah. 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 But you here, Eddie right? Murphy and uh, Dan Aykroyd. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a good one. $1. $1. Clients make or lose money, we <laughs> always make a commission. 
That's right. <laughs> but if you go now, if you go now on, for example, on Uniswap, you're gonna see the volumes of yesterday. You see what is the trading volumes and what are the fees, which is 0.3%. So you see them. And those 0.3% are being uh, provided to the liquidity providers. So it's it's very open, it's very transparent. Transparent. And it's very, very transparent. It never happened before Uniswap or decentralized exchange came into life. So that's why in, in here, I would just want to make a point even more there. These systems work 24 by seven, no one can shut them down and they have no circuit breakers. Right. That's right. That's, so they, that's, the, that's the key right there. Yeah. yeah. So building that framework properly around these new business models. If you're a business, let me give some advice here. If you're a business and you're running on an old business model, take heed. It's not going to work anymore. Your margins, and I told this to a guy, a multi-billionaire of a very large company in 2017, whose business is public, so I won't say what it is, and I won't say who he was. And I said, your hedge on holding all that money for three days, which is on your balance sheet, is going to go away. And you know who I'm talking about, Bob. Mm -hmm. and, and you're holding well over a trillion dollars. That's a lot of money every month for a three-day hold, right? And that is going to go away. That'll never happen. That was 2017. It's three years later. All right. Yeah. So business folks, just understand what the transparent tokenomic trustonomic market is about and understand what those economics are going to be in the future as these shifts take place. They will take place. There is not, this isn't an if anymore. This is a how. This isn't a why. We all know the why. This is about the how you're going to create future business models that are beneficial, yes, to businesses and economics, to your profit and bottom line, as well as to customers, the big market. Because what you really want is all those, what was it called, Wall Street coin or What's what's the name of the group? Wall the Street Bet. Wall Street, Street Bet token. You want all those guys on your side. Pushing. Yeah. You want them pushing, right? That's what you want. And those Power. are the kinds of things that we're going to talk about the world from here. And frankly, the world from here needs it. We the we're gonna, power we're of gonna, the people. We're gonna well, we're gonna dump trillions of dollars. The US government's gonna jump dump two trillion dollars into the marketplace. Those small business people, those people that are getting jobs need to be employed and we need to bring this thing back fast. We need to bring fundamentals back, not right, this right. manipulation. We need to bring fundamentals back. We need to bring fundamentals into the digital economy. Fundamentals. Like then, then you got a level playing field. Right. That's yeah. my opinion. You're fundamentals back to that. will always rule the day. I mean, there, there will be these wild swings like that, but fundamentals mm -hmm. will bring that back. There, there's always going to be, there's always going to be another Elon Musk. Spikes, spikes on people people just people. Lob and play. <laughs> that, that won't go away. <laughs> yeah. And we need to wrap up here, guys. This, uh, I, I so look forward to this. I couldn't sleep last night either, Daniel. Like, so uh, yeah. we, we, uh, we were glad to have you on here, Bob. We need to have you on here uh, again. My and, pleasure. Uh, great talk about this. And this is a point in time. And again, you can see this happening. Um, Uniswap wasn't even around a year ago. Right. Uh, DeFi was not here a year ago, and you can see well, what they were happened. here. They weren't pre people didn't know about it. They didn't know yeah. about it. Yeah, but I mean, I just looked, and 1.8 trillion dollars uh, changed hands on Uniswap uh, over the last 24 hours. So yeah, yeah I I mean that just shows it's the incredible. power. Of well, I would happening. say something something big is coming. Yes, something yeah, big is coming right now. It's if already here. <laughs> yeah, but uh, if we observe what's going on now in the last two to three days, uh, uh, there's something big that is coming. And yeah. we cannot anticipate, but at least to be ready not to sleep during the night. Right, yeah. right. 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 For a lot of people around the world here. And uh, we look forward to talking about that in the future coming weeks at the world from here. And Tim, you always uh, take us off by saying what you say. Well, 
I hope everybody with all of this, definitely, I'm going to flip it. Stay digital. Yeah. <laughs> Stay safe and healthy at the same time. Uh, we, we, our hearts go out to everybody who's locked down, um, still suffering with this pandemic. Uh, just look at this. There's a lot of bright spots in the world and a lot of really positive changes happening too and really important change. So we're here to wish you truly to stay, stay safe, stay healthy, stay digital and, and like us, subscribe to us, tell people, you know, we are trying to share information that's important out there and share a platform that's important to at blockcerts.com. So come in and join that party and, and uh, be part of the solution and part of the future. Yeah, Sounds and please great. make some make some comments below too, because we'd love to hear from you, and we will respond to your comments as well. Yeah, and and I, I, are, and good point, Bob. Those guide our future discussions uh, mm -hmm. to a, a high degree of how we bring information out and what we can talk about and thought leaders we can find, like we did with Bob today. Yeah, yeah for absolutely. sure. And, and I always uh, I'm <clears throat> viewing comments as we're talking and bringing that into our discussion here, and uh, we do have a very uh, a very active uh, Telegram group, and I put the, our Telegram channel in our comments. So if you'd like to Good. join our telephone, Telegram group, definitely do so. Um, Alec brought some great information in the last 24 hours. Thanks, Alec, in the Telegram group. And then I post some questions in there about uh, gold being backed by gold versus technology. And right. uh, <clears throat> just uh, join our group, and you'll find out more there. Thank technology you. Technology is a new gold, not Dan. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, guys. Have Enjoyed the conversation. Time.